Well, good afternoon, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the lunchtime portion of Macro SA. We hope you're enjoying everything. Of course, I'm the evening anchor here at Ken's TV in San Antonio. And I'm the other evening anchor. <laughs> and we thank you for being uh, here with us today. And we thank the Chamber for sponsoring such a tremendous program. Great lunch. Slab of beef there. You gotta like it in San Antonio. Uh, Sarah and I have the opportunity to introduce today's keynote speaker. And as of a few days ago, we were all under the presumption that you would be hearing from CBS Evening News anchor, Scott Pelley. Well, as you know, it turns out that Scott got called off on assignment at the very last minute, and then he got called off of that assignment at the last minute because of the attack at the U.S. consulate in Libya, as you all know. And as all news folks know, news changes minute by minute, and when you're the anchor of the CBS Evening News, you must be ready to switch gears at a moment's notice. So instead of lament about an opportunity lost, we have decided to talk about an opportunity gained today. So we've decided to rip a page out of the playbook of one of the best at CBS, David Letterman. <laughs> and now the top five reasons, we don't want to go ten, you know, five, ten's five, we want to work in that plug, right Bob? We have to work in that plug. The top five reasons why Scott Pelley is really not here with us today, and instead, you get to hear from the president of CBS News, David Rhodes. Okay, reason number five. Scott's team of stylists noticed that his hair was out of alignment, and they had to keep him back in New York to make sure that it was perfect. You know how important that quality Yeah, we heard about that. Yes. Well, reason number four. He knew that it was premiere week for Katie Couric, and he promised her a sit-down exclusive interview. <laughs> okay, reason number three. Okay, he really, really, really sets aside Wednesdays to keep up with the Kardashians. Because you know, you all see the show, it's an only affair. It, it can is. Be. It can be, yeah. Up with that. Reason number two. We found out that it takes Pelly actually a good two days just to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> The number one reason why Scott Kelly could not make it today, ooh, he forgot his birthday gifts for the Costco twins and he stayed in New York City to shop for them. So. <laughs> right, Special thanks to Bill Taylor for participating yeah, in that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, Scott Kelly may be the big gun at CBS News, but David Rhodes is the top gun. And in all seriousness, we are extremely lucky to be up here with the honor of introducing a man of great distinction in the field of journalism. David was, is made president of CBS News in February of 2011. He oversees news network gathering and breaking news coverage in that role, including programs such as the CBS Evening News, CBS This Morning, CBS Sunday Morning, Face the Nation, 48 Hours, and content for CBSNews.com and CBS News Radio. Under his management, CBS News has seen significant ratings growth across all broadcasts. In particular, Face the Nation has become the number one Sunday public affairs show in the important news demographic of adults 25 to 54. In addition, the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley is the only network news evening broadcast to post year-to-year -year gains in households, viewers, and adults 25 to 54. Before joining CBS, David rose to the top in management at Bloomberg in 2008, joining the network as its head of U.S. television. Prior to that, David spent 12 years at the Fox News Channel, starting there in 1996. He started as a production assistant and working his way up the ladder to eventually become, oops, vice president of news at Fox. It was at Fox where my career crossed with David. We both got there during the startup years of what is now an upstart network. I was a correspondent based out of Chicago, where I worked at FNC for nine years, and David for years ran the desk as the network's assignment manager. David directed much of the network's news coverage from there at the desk, whether it be political campaign, wars, or Hurricane Katrina, in the process playing a key role in taking this one-time startup network to a perch as the number one news station in all of cable, a position of dominance that it has held since 2002. David essentially, he has an encyclopedia up there in his head, well before the days of Google, 
You could be on the phone with him and he would give you some piece of insider information that would help you with the story, whether it be in Chicago or Miami or Dallas. It didn't matter the place. David knows a lot about it. I recall one day, if I could just share one small anecdote here, I'm in the airport somewhere, I, it escapes me exactly where, and I'm trying to get directions to a plane, and David is giving me detailed directions over the phone about exactly where to go. Again, this is before the internet. He is that sharp, and he's that insightful. He's one of the most decisive and hardest working leaders whom I've ever met, and to underscore all that, we learned this morning that he was up most of the night monitoring events in Libya and directing CBS News coverage. The guy's done a lot. <laughs> a lot. So fast forward to the present. Since joining CBS News, David has been named to the power list of several prominent media and business publications, including Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40, Crane's New York's Business 40 Under 40, The Hollywood Reporter's 35 Most Powerful People in Media, and GQ's The 50 Most Powerful People in Washington. That's great, David, We're making GQ. That's good stuff. <laughs> For some people getting on all those lists, it might go to your head, but David is a tremendously humble guy. Heck, he'll even often take the subway and the bus around New York City, where he lives with his wife and two young sons. So enough of us, you came here this afternoon to hear from someone at CBS News. So I'd like to present to you today Today's keynote speaker, my one-time boss, and a man whom I deeply respect, David Rhodes. Jeff, Jeff, uh, Jeff did work for me, and uh, <laughs> and I was on the way down here last night. <clears throat> First, I looked at uh, kind of what was laid out for today, and I saw Jeff was going to be introducing me, and that's why you should always be nice to people, because uh, <laughs> you never know. Uh, but that wasn't just a party trick with the airport thing, too. It helped in his career because, you know, people were like, well, I, I can't get there. I can't. And I, my answer was usually, well, yeah, you can. You could go out of Midway and change in St. Louis and you, you could get there. You'll have to travel all night. You can get there, right, Jeff? <laughs> You're there. Um, now, that's it. Uh, Scott really did want to be here today, um, and he did uh, give us a taped message, which I'd uh, like to show the group. So you can tell, watching that, how much Scott wanted to be here today, uh, to come home to San Antonio to share what we're learning through our reporting about your topic today, the economy, to tell you a little bit about the values that we think will bring CBS News success in our own business. Of course, the irony of that tape, isn't it, is that even if that whole bit with the Romney interview was happening, well, we blew that up today, too. So, um, you know, the first... Uh, the first time I heard the name J. Christopher Stevens, who was our ambassador uh, in Libya until yesterday's events, um, was I landed here about 10 p.m. last night. One of our reporters believed at that point, at that point the reporting was that one State Department staffer had been lost in this incident in Benghazi. And at that point last night, one of our reporters believed that there was an extraction team being prepared to go and get the ambassador. The ambassador's name hadn't been in any story up until that point. Um, as Jeff, as other mentioned, others mentioned, there's been a series of fast-moving events overnight uh, that have revealed uh, tragically that uh, Stevens, who ironically helped liberate uh, Libya, from the Gaddafi regime uh, died in that incident at the, uh, at the consulate overnight. So we've had a series of reports this morning about that. Um, we've uh, had no sooner have we canceled on the chamber than we canceled on Mitt Romney. So we're, uh, we're betting a thousand on cancellations today. Um, but you know, to the importance of what we do, and especially in a time when a horrific event like 
Benghazi can happen on the 11th anniversary of a much more horrific event. I think it just underscores the importance of what we do, or what we're trying to do. It's the 45th season of 60 Minutes this year, and if you saw the broadcast on Sunday, you know it's going to be an extraordinary one. We devoted the entire hour to the Navy SEAL, who was the second man in the room last year during the successful raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Now, I do want to tell you that uh, thinking about today, filling in for Scott, knowing how excited people were to meet and spend time with him, I did, I did think about the part of that report where Mark Owen, as he's called, uh, describes the crash of the Black Hawk helicopter that was carrying him into the compound. And Scott says, what did you think when that happened? What went through your mind? And he said, uh, that this is gonna suck. <laughs> But then I also thought maybe a city with an energetic 37-year-old mayor might accept an address from an energetic 38-year-old news president. So, so here's hoping. Um, you know, one thing I'm confident of, and you heard Scott talk about Texas, is that for us, the path to success and what we're trying to accomplish really does run through here. Now, Scott was born here in Bear County. Bear County. <laughs> um, you know, went to Texas Tech, lived in Lubbock, jokes about his first uh, job in television being what he calls a wood, little wood burning television station in the panel. Um, really made a career in Dallas, and that's how he came to us uh, at the network club. Nora O'Donnell is our new co host of CBS This Morning. She uh, was in San Antonio where her father was in Fort Sam Houston for 10 years. Uh, she went to MacArthur High, along with apparently one of our cast members at Ken's Five. Um, she was the head cheerleader. Just ask her. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, now she's the head cheerleader at CBS News, so, uh, so some things uh, never change. But, you know, I think she feels a strong connection to the community. And of course, um, there's Bob Schieffer, who I think one of my first events as president here was going to Austin where Bob was winning something called the Texas Medal of the Arts, which is a pretty extraordinary event. Um, but, you know, Bob is Fort Worth's own and, uh, you know, doesn't own any socks that aren't purple, uh, thanks to his TCU affiliation. And, and really is passionate about the state. If that's not enough, and that's a lot, um, I've got my father to tell me about the experience of growing up in Baytown with no air conditioning, <laughs> which is sort of the Gulf Coast equivalent of walking uphill barefoot in the snow both ways to school, <laughs> is living in Baytown with no air conditioning. <clears throat> um, uh, or I can recall being a student at Rice when we actually beat Texas. Um, you know, the funny thing is no one went to the game. I mean, <laughs> from, from Rice because we weren't going to win. Um, and then there was sort of a biblical rainstorm. And Texas had a really good passing game that year. So, uh, you know, but we won. So more on that in a moment. You know, <laughs> look, Bob is right now preparing for the presidential debates. There are three this fall. Bob is going to moderate the last one uh, in Boca Raton on October 22nd, just two weeks out from Election Day. Now, that event's meant to focus on foreign policy. But like everything else this season, we mentioned 60 Minutes, these debates, our coverage, you know, even given today's horrific events, Everything is boiling down to the topic that's being discussed here today, and that's the economy. There's two important facts from our polling on this subject that I just want to share with you today. You know, we poll presidential campaigns, we poll approval and disapproval of our leadership, 
of candidates. In that poll, over many years, we've always asked two questions. One is the right track, wrong track question. Do you believe that America is on the right track or is it on the wrong track? And we've polled how people feel about the economy. So not a full consumer confidence study, but just really what's out there. What's the sentiment? Do you think it's good, bad, improving, declining? Now, what might surprise you to learn, it, what might surprise you is not that people feel nationally that the economy is not good, or that people feel nationally that we're on the wrong track. What I think is surprising is how long they've felt that. Now, it's at this point in this survey, four years, that people have felt that the economy is bad or getting worse, a majority. But worse, it's eight years that a majority have felt that the country is on the wrong track every time that that survey is taken. And you know, just in civic dialogues like this meeting today, or even just in kitchen table conversations, people talk about the acronym. Why is there so much disagreement uh, in public life today? Uh, that's why. Because of those two figures. Because we've rarely seen, and not in the history of this survey, that people have felt that bad for that long about the way things are going, and by the way, in two very remarkably different type of administrations. It's a very volatile mix of public opinion, and it really drives a lot of the economic sentiment that uh, many of you in business confront on a daily basis, uh, even if, in many measures, uh, things have been remarkably better here in Texas than uh, the nation as a whole. Coming back to our campaign coverage and what this is all about. Now you saw in that interview, which was in St. Petersburg last weekend, that the president told Scott, look, I was willing to give 250 in spending for every dollar in revenue, and they wanted 10 and 1. And Scott said, challenging him, yeah, but that's what they wouldn't accept last summer. Why is it going to be different in a new term? The president says, well, that's what this election is about. And that is what this election is about. In a way, our political process came to an impasse last summer with the debt debacle, with the downgrade, uh, couldn't work it out, and basically threw it to us and said, you know, work this out for us. So in about two months, we're going to get to work it out for them. Um, now let me play management, not a reporter, again for a minute. Um, because part of the fun of this is reporting, but we're running a business too. We're running an information business, and an information business is one of the fastest changing, most challenging that you could be in. CBS News is a great American institution. I mean, just in the past week, we've had unique access to that Navy SEAL, to the President, to Governor Romney, to Paul Ryan, to Hillary Clinton on the road in Vladivostok, to Secretary Panetta responding to the SEAL, and so on. But how do we keep that vital? How do we draw audiences to that, larger audiences, over our traditional platform, partners and distributors like uh, Ken's Five, which is such a robust affiliate for CBS here in San Antonio, um, and still manage the really extraordinary technological change around us. Now the answer is that our customers have an expectation of us. They have an expectation of each of these organizations. It's actually different from one to the other. It's not the same expectation. I've worked at three very different news organizations, from Fox to Bloomberg to CBS now. You know, when I worked at Bloomberg, one night we moved the equity index futures number from one side of the screen to the other. <laughs> you would not believe the calls. <laughs> I mean, it was like last night, except 
and I didn't quite understand it because nobody had died, but people were upset. And I think, you know, the lesson of it was they expect something specific from you. You have to meet that expectation. And if you do, they keep coming back. And if you don't, they're eh, just not that interesting. So, you know, at CBS, we've had winning franchises. We have 60 Minutes, Sunday Morning, Now Face the Nation, number one. And we've had a morning program that, frankly, has been a lot like Bryce football. <laughs> Smart people, well-meaning, not always winning. Um, but, you know, a lot of that losing was from trying to be something that we're not cute, silly. You know, the competition put on a concert, we put on a concert. You know, the competition sautéed onions, we sautéed onions. I, mean, I said to one of these TV talent, you know, let's be honest, nobody believes you wear an apron at home, so why are they going to believe you're wearing one at the office? I mean, it just doesn't fit. Now, they're coming to us. CBS News because they expect us to be tough. That we'll ask direct questions, the ones they'd ask if they were in that position. Mike Wallace's greatest question, the late Mike Wallace, and we relived a lot of his great moments in this last year. You know, his greatest question was usually, why? That's it. No long preamble explaining how much he knows about the subject. Just that. And then usually they would hang themselves. That's why Rice Place Texas, that's why we unveiled CBS this morning. I think you'll love our approach, because I think we'll do what's expected of us, um, and you know, if it rains hard and shuts down the other guy's passing game, we might run up the middle and, uh, <laughs> and win one, even in this economy. So thank you, thank you for supporting uh, Ken's, uh, and for inviting us today, uh, and I really would like to, uh, to answer some questions. Season. In a day like today, where you have very serious, hard news that you dedicate, or t tell me the process you go through in deciding how do you, why do you include Mitt Romney reaction? We at a time now where political figures running for office get the same and equal time on hard news events. Um, I'm just curious how you, how you come up with that decision. You know, I, I go back to, uh, it's a different kind of story, uh, but the Supreme Court's decision on health care law. Um, now that day, uh, we expected that the President would speak after that. We expected that Governor Romney would speak after that. At that point, he was not formally the nominee, and of course in our system, uh, being the standard bearer after a convention, comes with certain statutory responsibilities, exposure to intelligence briefings, and so forth. <clears throat> but, you know, when the expectation was that the law would go down, which we never reported that it went down, uh, uh, not being judgmental about those who did, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, we expected to actually maybe take his remarks as a live event, same as Romney the president. What we ended up doing that day was uh, Romney spoke, we put it on tape. Uh, Obama spoke, we took it live, and then right after we took that live, we played back the entire Romney tape. So we made it one broadcast where people who saw that saw both, and they didn't see one or the other. Um, you know, today, um, some of it's going to be determined by these two men and how they approach that. 
this morning, we, after our morning broadcast, in much of the country, we took Hillary Clinton and broke into the regular uh, CBS programming for her remarks. Um, I was up in Bob's office at uh, Ken's, and uh, we came back to the president and took his remarks, which were just about Stevens and the situation. Um, no politics and didn't take questions. Um, now, we don't think that's going to last as far as it being about the people we lost and the unfolding situation, which is pretty alarming. I mean, our government thinks that, you know, there's a really good chance this was not just a spontaneous mob reaction to what some thought was an offensive film, but actually a coordinated effort timed to the 9-11 anniversary. Um, but, you know, the Romney campaign is uh, eager to make a point about how they think we've positioned ourselves facing the threat of radical Islam. Uh, and even now, we think that the president is making new comments in a new interview with us for the same 60 Minutes project that uh, Scott mentioned, uh, which we're hoping to have a little later this afternoon, in which he's going to be critical back uh, at Romney's criticism of him. So I think some of it's the nature of an election year. We're within two months, and these things are pretty swiftly politicized, but we try to do the best we can. Uh, yes, over here. On another note, uh, could you give us your thoughts on the future of broadcast TV, given the Internet and the proliferation of mobile devices throughout the country? That's a great question. It's the most important business challenge um, that we have to manage. And I say manage because it is something that is happening, um, but it should not necessarily be something that disrupts our business, and in fact, it could be something that could be extraordinary for our business. You know, what we basically know how to do is create news content. And we have colleagues in other parts of CBS who know how to create entertainment or sports con content. And right now, the most compelling way for many people to receive that and the most compelling opportunity for advertisers that want to be alongside that is on over-the-air broadcast television because of the sizes of the audience and because we've been able to integrate ourselves in a multi-channel video provider uh, scenario <clears throat> so that we're compensated in other ways. Will it always be like that? Well, you know, the content's important. And I think uh, since coming on, I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley talking to people who are working hard on sort of the frontier of how people will touch this content on mobile. Um, and I think we've got as good a chance of figuring that out as anybody in that community. And the reason is that we still have a very robust franchise and millions of people watching and a lot of people who want to be alongside our content. Everybody's followed the story of the Facebook offer. The enormous hype leading up to that. I mean, 1999 levels of hype, right? And now uh, you got to get in on this, and it's you, know, you want to buy it at any price. And you know, look, they sold a 30-something dollar stock, and people who were there at the inception were, you know, half of that's been wiped out. Worse, a lot of insiders have sold into that because their basis in this was very low. Um, but they've had to explain why this has happened, other than oversupply of shares, um, other than maybe misjudging the market. And you know what their explanation is? They're getting killed by mobile. Facebook. They're saying, you know, look, I mean, our, our traditional business, I mean, that's really solid, but boy, this whole transition to mobile, I mean, that's just crushing Facebook. Now, they're saying that. That's something we'd be expected to be saying. In fact, what we've found so far is that desktop, online, and mobile have been great brand extensions and promotional opportunities for us, social media, certainly for our journalists, um, and myself. 
Um, and so those have been helpful, and we think that when some professional content starts to transition over there, we think we'll bring advertisers with us, and it'll be every bit as robust as broadcast ever was. Who has Facebook shares? <laughs> Good. Considering your previous employment and where you are now, how do you overcome that liberal media stigma that might possibly be applied to you now in your new occupation? Right, right. Well, like I said, I've worked, I've, I've done all kinds, right? I've worked at Fox for 12 years, uh, Bloomberg for a couple, um, CBS. Um, Attitudes about any of these media are hard to change if there's a, uh, if the public believes something about what your, pro about your product. And that goes for everybody in this room, whether it's media or something else. Um, you know, the great thing about Fox, having been there from the inception, uh, although I ran a teleprompter on my first day, so I wasn't really, you know, <laughs> getting that tacked up with what was in it. Um, but look, Fox was built into a great franchise because many people in this country either don't trust or just plain don't like the other options. Um, you know, we still have millions of people come to these broadcasts and, uh, and a good day for me, I think, uh, is when we take in coming from both sides about how we handled something. I think, frankly, one of the great things about working with Scott since we've elevated him is that nobody really knows where he is, and that is so rare in this environment. So what it ends up being is just something that you have to be constantly diligent about to try to make sure that those labels, and they are labels, don't stick. Any others? Yeah. So you spoke about the internet's impact on your content delivery channels. Speak about the internet and social media's impact on integrity. We've seen the competitors have to put a mildly snafus with the OR shootings. How do you keep integrity with the speed of the internet and social media? Because of the ubiquity of social media, being first with something has become harder. Um, because there's sort of an environmental awareness of things, um, and people come to your platform, whether that's, you know, they turn on Ken's, they watch the cable channel, they go to their desktop, and their expectations of what they will find are different. Credibility a generation ago, if you free associated that, would mean, well, it's credible, like it's real and authentic and correct and I can trust it. That's credibility. Credibility today is affected by, you know, I hear there's been a plane crash. Somebody tweets it, somebody, you know, shares it, and I go to your channel, and if you don't have it, you don't have credibility to me, because I know about that, and you're a big bad, you know, CBS, and you don't know about this? I know about this. What's, what's the matter with you people? Don't you know that, you know? So, the viewer's expectation is different, um, and the speed is faster. I think the problem is people are having trouble adjusting. Um, speed is overrated. Why there should be some rush to be the first one to declare a celebrity dead is sort of beyond me. I mean, you know, if they're dead, they're not coming back to life, so you'll, you'll get to it. Um, people are making mistakes because they're trying, they, because they're putting too much of a premium on that and not enough of a premium on being the one who when people do come with that environmental awareness of what's going on, their curiosity about learning more is satisfied. Now, in our own organization, we've tried to walk a fine line on this because we think we will make mistakes. But we have avoided some of those more spectacular errors of our competitors lately, and I think it's because we've tried to emphasize internally 
that that second part of the value proposition is more important than the first. Good? Thanks so much.